All right, so um, I'm Karen Roberts. I'm the environmental scientist here at ES. I'm looking at the Estuaries and the Lakes program. Today I'm specifically going to focus on um, some of the work we've been doing in our coastal lakes. And I really want to demonstrate to you today that working together across disciplines leads to better outcomes for landowners and water quality in our coastal lakes. So I'm going to go do that in two parts. Firstly, I'll give you a quick overview of our coastal lakes program and then I'll move into a more detailed case study in our Lake Vincent catchment. So before we kick off, I'd just like to acknowledge the project members. So the ecosystem response team, which includes our field team, Diane Elliott and Chris Owen, and the Lake Vincent project team, which includes my predecessor, James Dare, Simon Mapp um, from ES, Nathan Crookshank from ES, and the Lake Vincent catchment landowners. So in 2015, our Coastal Lakes program uh, began, and this includes Lake George, Lake Vincent, and the reservoir. So this fits into our wider Lakes and Lagoons program, which also includes the glacial lakes, uh, Waituna and Waiau Lagoon. And hopefully we'll soon be adding Lake Bronton to that as well. So why did we choose to start monitoring these coastal lakes? They're quite shallow lakes. We have very little information on them, and they're quite susceptible to change. So because these lakes are shallow, they have uh, large ranging in temperature, they're quite prone to increased nutrient and sediment loads, uh, and they have residence time of maybe one to two months. So in Southland, our coastal lakes are largely in agricultural catchments, and this includes pra land use practices such as wintering on forage crops, self-feed pads and storage of silage. So these lakes are often prone to increased sediment and nutrient loads, which can lead to a decline in water quality in these lakes. So intensification over the last few decades, we actually have seen a decrease in water quality and we're starting to see symptoms of eutrophication in each of our coastal lakes. So this not only has an impact on lake health, but it can also have flow on effects for social, cultural and economic values. So these eutrophication symptoms are increased incidences of algal blooms and cyanobacterial blooms. And last summer we have actually seen uh, cyanobacterial blooms in a number of our lakes here in Southland. So I'll move into the case study now on Lake Vincent. So I really want to acknowledge the project team here. I'm actually getting to present a lot of the work that they've, they have done previously. Uh, so that's, again, James Dare, Simon Mapp, and Nathan Crookshank from Environment Southland. So in 2016, James Dare, the lake scientist at the time, was out monitoring the lake, and he noticed that there was increased macrophyte growth and there was biofilm starting to build up on our equipment. And this is not something we've actually seen before. So he went back to the office and started to dig, dig a bit deeper into the water quality data we've been collecting, and he noticed that total nitrogen was in exceedance of the national bottom line, and total phosphorus was in the sea banding. So Lake Vincent was actually showing signs of poor water quality. When he went back and compared this to a study in 2004, which I think, Mark, you actually collected the data for that, he noticed that the concentrations of total nitrogen and total phosphorus were much higher than they have been previously. So Environment Southland decided to have a joint response to this, this de degradation in water quality. So whilst um, James was out doing this monitoring, he actually noticed that there was quite a few land practices on farms that could be point sources to the lake. So he come back to ES and discuss this with our land sustainability team and they decided to expedite the farm plans in each of the three farms within the catchment. He also discussed this with compliance and they started an investigation also. So land, land sustainability's response to this was to expedite farm plans. Science carried out education visits with farmers but we also continued to collect our monitoring data and we helped compliance with some of the point source investigations as well. So this is really a team effort to support landowners and give them the right tools to start making these land use management changes to then improve lake 
water quality in Lake Vincent. So three problem areas were identified in Lake Vincent. Uh, you can see this black patch here is actually the lake. And this region here is the inlet. So the three problem areas that were identified were wintering uh, on forage crop to the lake's edges with no buffer zones, uh, silage storage near the inlet, so this area here, <coughs> and self-feed pads. So there are three self-feed pads near the lake that could potentially be point sources. So I'm just going to go through that in a little bit more detail and explain how we investigated the point source itself and then the solution that was put in place. So firstly, I'll go over the silage stack at the inlet. So if you can imagine, this is a silage storage area on a concrete base. And this is actually elevated above the lake. So this small uh, blue line here represents a, a small inlet into the lake. We're actually seeing leachate from this silage stack flowing directly down the hill and into this inflow, which then was flowing into the lake. So after discussing this with the, the farmer and showing him some of the results, we collected some samples at this small inflow here. Um, it was, as you can see from these, um, red bars here. The concentrations of total nitrogen and total phosphorus in that inflow were extremely high. And just to put it into context, the national bottom line for total nitrogen in a lake is 800 and total phosphorus is 50. So these numbers are extremely high. So the solution to this was the farmer didn't want to retire that silage storage area. Instead, he decided he'll capture the leachate and so he's got a tank now in which the leachate flows into the tank and he disperses that elsewhere on farm. So after he started doing this, you can see this uh, black line here represents this change. Total nitrogen and total phosphorus dropped in this inflow quite significantly. The second point source was uh, self-feed pads. So there were three self-feed pads that were identified close to the lake that could potentially be point sources. So we use the method of electromagnetic induction and basically this measures subsurface soil conductivity. So effluent has a higher conductivity than your natural soils. So you're able to compare effluent contaminated soils with um, your standard background concentration you would normally find in a soil. So the blue colour here represents uh, all your normal um, soil background concentration and the yellow and the green colour represents an effluent contaminated soil. So this method is really good for identifying whether there's a plume of conductivity moving away from your feed pad and then this is a potential source. So the two out to the west were considered quite localised sources and not significant for the lake whilst the one at the inlet here you can see is a nice big well, not nice, but, but a big yellow and green patch um, moving down the hill and towards the inlet from the feed pad. So this was identified as a, a likely a key source to Lake Vincent. So this feed pad was actually retired um, and all new feed pads on farm have appropriate effluent capture. The final one was wintering practices um, on farm. So. Uh, Previous to these management, um, I guess, implementation of different management for land use, the farmer was wintering up to the lake margins and into the lake. So there was no buffer zone between these wintering practices and the lake itself. So since then, there's been fencing and exclusion of stock from the lake. And there's also been a significant amount of riparian planting around the lake margins. So just a quick overview of the outcomes of this work. Uh, this was done in 2016, so we've seen these land use improvements in 2016. Uh, and we've got a comparison here of 2016 data compared to 2017. And you can see there is a drop in total nitrogen and total phosphorus um, between years. Now I'd like to say this was completely attributed to these land use changes, 
but it's obviously way too early just to, to tell this and determine whether this is a trend or whether it was due to something else, for example, less rainfall. Uh, so over the next few years, state of environment monitoring should tell us whether this case study has been uh, working. <coughs> so just finally, to link it back to the theme of integration, I think this case study really highlighted that this cross-disciplinary approach provided a diverse range of tools and expertise, which allowed us to help the farmers make these land use changes and improve water quality. And I think this can be potentially applied to other coastal lakes in our region. So, thank you.